This, this word I used before, it's called the diaspora. The diaspora are the Jews scattered around the world, and they're still scattered till this day. But the, um, this diaspora, the scattering of the Jews, uh, has led to some things that are really important in terms of New Testament studies. Um, what happened is, in early Judaism, in the time of Jesus, you had the temple, and everything basically focused around the temple. You had the high priesthood, and the priests, and the scribes, and every, the temple was the focus. But after 70 AD, the Romans come in and destroy the temple, totally take it down, knock it down, rock upon rock is taken down. The temple is absolutely destroyed, 70 AD. Then what happens is the diaspora, which were scattered all over the world, since 721 BC, when the Syrians scattered them, and then again when the Babylonians came in and took Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Ezekiel, and others away, uh, Jehoiakim, Achin, um, basically the Jews built these synagogues. And the synagogues where they were scattered, if they had 10 males, then they could form these synagogues. And the synagogue structure is in, a, in place till this day. And on the north shore of Boston here, you go out, there's synagogues all over the place, even here in the north shore of Boston to this day. So the diaspora is a scattering of Jews. Now what will happen is, and why that's important for the New Testament is, Paul will go from synagogue to synagogue. When Paul comes into a new city, the first place he goes is to the synagogue. Paul will go into the synagogue. He'll preach in the synagogue. Many people receive the gospel. He'll come back the second day. They'll invite him back. He'll preach again. And as he preaches again, there's more and more opposition. And finally, you, this is just stereotyping it, but then he comes a third time. And by the time he comes a third time, the, the Jewish folks are on to him and they basically drag him out, stone him, beat him up or do whatever. Okay, And they throw him out of the synagogue and Paul is kicked out. And that happens repeatedly, especially in the first missionary journey that we'll see in the book of Acts. Now, I want to switch again away from the various Jewish sects, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and, um, and the Diaspora. And what I, the Diaspora is not really a sect, it's just the scattering of the Jews. What I'd like to talk now is about the institutions of Judaism, and just walk through some of those. These institutions are going to come up in the New Testament, and they're going to play a role uh, with Jesus is going to run into these as, as, as well as with others. And the first institution I'd like to talk about is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is built off, is a Jewish structure. It's run by the high priest, and so you've got a guy like Caiaphas being the high priest in the time of Jesus. He's going to condemn Jesus and things. So you got the, it's run, the Sanhedrin is run by the high priest, the Sadducees dominated this. The Sadducees uh, were the wealthy ones, politically active, assimilated, and things. They run the, uh, the Sanhedrin, along with the scribes. The scribes are going to be scribes. When you say scribe, it's like you're copying your, your, their legal peop, their people. But actually, the scribes are going to be more your legal people. In other words, when you have a question about the law, you go to the scribes. They're the technicians. They're the analysts. Maybe that's the way it's... They're the analysts, the technicians. They know the law. So when you've got a problem, you go to the scribes, and the scribes will give you the technical details of what the text says and things. The elders would be, you know, the older people and things that they would put elders in there as well as the priests. You had the high priest, the scribes, the elders, and this would be the Sanhedrin. It was a judicial body. It was a judicial body, uh, kind of um, mocked up from... Do you remember Moses was uh, doing all the work of all the judicial systems? This is back in Numbers 11, and Moses asked God for some help, and God then takes the spirit off Moses and puts it on the 70, and those 70 people then do judgment in Israel, and they make court case judicial decisions, and if they have any trouble with that, then Moses gets the case, but those 70 people help him. So this uh, Sanhedrin is kind of built on that kind of a model. After 70 AD, it's, it's disbanded. After 70 AD, the uh, Sanhedrin is disbanded. As we said, it was largely run by the Sadducees. Now, um, what could the Sanhedrin do? Under Rome, the Sanhedrin had certain powers. They had the power of arrest and trial. They could arrest someone, and they could try someone. And so that gave them power. But there was, they did not have the right of capital punishment. In other words, the Sanhedrin... While they could arrest and try people, they could not put them to death without permission from Rome. And so this becomes a problem then. Um, this becomes a problem because in the time of Christ, the Sanhedrin tries them. 
Jesus goes before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. And what do they want to do? You've heard his blasphemy. He deserves death. And so they say, they all scream, crucify him, crucify him. But, but the Sanhedrin can't crucify. They can't kill him until they get Roman approval. That's why they take him to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate gets in because the Sanhedrin cannot do capital punishment. They have to have the permission of Rome. So they take Jesus over to see Pontius Pilate, and then Pontius Pilate, you know, um, basically interviews Jesus. And, um, and then Pilate's wife, do you remember, she says, you know, be careful about this guy. I've had a nightmare about him and things. And then Pilate washes his hands. And, and you know, Pilate also sets up that thing with uh, um, Barabbas. Do you remember? That it was right to, at the feast to free one of the Jews. And, and Pilate says, do you want us to free Barabbas? And they all cry out, you know, or Jesus, which one do you want? Because he knew it was out of spite that they did it. And the people cry out, we want Barabbas freed. And Jesus then goes off to be crucified, uh, Pilate washing his hands and that kind of a thing. So that's the Sanhedrin and the role they play as kind of a judicial thing. <coughs> Excuse me. The synagogue. We talked about the synagogue and its background. Largely, the synagogue was a product of the temple um, not having access to the temple, the Jews being scattered all over the world. So whatever city they were in, if they had 10 adult males, uh, basically they would form a synagogue. And so there's synagogues all over the ancient world and even to the present. Uh, basically, you had to have 10 uh, heads of household. And the function, there were basically four functions of the synagogues. Okay, The synagogue's first function was as a school. It, not first function in terms of importance, but it did function. The synagogue functioned as a school. Uh, wherever the Jewish people have gone, they are big into education. The Jewish people teach their people how to read because they want them to read the scriptures, the scriptures they view as the word of God. So schools are very important, and the Jewish people have always been a very, very educated people. That education, a lot of it will come out of the synagogue, and then the synagogues are scattered all over. Okay, Worship. The synagogue was a place of worship. People would come to the synagogue to worship God. It was also a Jewish kind of court system uh, in certain ways making uh, smaller decisions that could be made within the Jewish community uh, with the permission of those people, you know, the governmental areas that would have different rules and things, local, local areas there. But they were largely a Jewish court system. And then social. Uh, what do you need, in a certain sense, a church for, a synagogue for? Marrying and burying. Marrying and burying. Is that when you can see a lot about a culture in the process of marrying and burying? A lot of cultural rituals will come up with marrying when a couple gets married. I think you can remember um, uh, the fiddler on the roof and marriages, and then burying people again. They have to be buried in a way that's consistent with Judaism among the diaspora, among the scattered Jews. And so these are the four functions. And so um, the synagogue wasn't just, it had multiple functions. And then Paul, as he travels and his first and second, third missionary journey, will continually come into these synagogues and things at Corinth. Uh, even one of the synagogue leaders will become a Christian. And so uh, the synagogue played a really important role for the spread of Christianity when Christianity was considered actually part of Judaism initially. So the synagogue... Now, I just want to run through the worship service just to contrast it to our modern-day worship service, okay, our, our church service. And basically, the Jewish church service or the synagogue service, they'll have the Shema. The Shema is uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 following, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. One of the most famous verses every Jew in the world, I swear, knows this verse. It's like the John 3.16 for Judaism. Shema Yisrael and Anai Echeinu Anai Echad, Hear, O Israel. Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. That is the affirmation of monotheism. Jewish people are going to be scattered in a Roman Empire that is full of polytheism. And they say there is one God, and Yahweh is his name. And thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart. So am I. So the Shema is cited, recited. Then there's prayer. They have prayer. Uh, then scripture. Now, scripture reading, when you come into a, a church service, what is the most important? Where is the focus of the church service? Oftentimes, um, the church service, the focus is on the sermon, the, the expo exposition of Scripture, and the sermon. The sermon takes, you know, 20, 30 minutes and things, okay, or longer, okay? In Jewish circles, 
The sermon is a minor part. The major focus of a Jewish worship service is the reading of Scripture. And so they will read extensive and long portions of Scripture. The whole book of Esther get, gets read, the book of Purim, and the Feast of Purim and things. And so they'll read large portions of Scripture and read through the Torah on a, so that the person, people go over and over the Torah over their life. So the reading of Scripture is a really important part of the, the synagogue service. Then they'll have a short homily, a uh, sermon, and, uh, and then lastly, they'll have a priestly blessing. And, you know, the Lord bless you and keep you, or make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace, that kind of a thing. Uh, Numbers uh, was at 624 and following, the priestly blessing. So the uh, rabbi will uh, do a blessing then. So this is the synagogue. And by the way, you can go to synagogues in the North Shore, and you'll see the importance that they place on Scripture. Uh, they also sometimes, when we've been there, uh, Dr. Wilson takes groups and things of Gordon College students there. I remember one time we went, um, and the students, we went to the synagogue and went through the whole ceremony. I don't know whether it was a bar mitzvah. Do you guys know about bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs? But they'll have a bar mitzvah when a child is about 12 years old and they want to welcome a young you know, boy or girl into the adult community. They'll do what's called a bar mitzvah, where bar means son of, um, and bebat mitzvah will be daughter of, and they'll basically welcome them into the adult community. And uh, anyways, we're in this uh, synagogue church service, and so we went through the service, and afterwards then, Dr. Wilson allowed his students to ask questions to the rabbi. So the rabbi comes down, and you know, students are asking him, peppering him with questions and things. Then the students took off, and they went over to eat food, you know, students, you know how it is, non-Gordon food, we, they just go for it. And so I stayed with Dr. Wilson, and it was really interesting. When the rabbi came down, the rabbi started asking Dr. Wilson questions about the, the, the Talmud. And uh, it was really funny because the students had all asked the rabbi the question. The rabbi came down and said to Dr. Wilson, what do you think about this from the Talmud? And Dr. Wilson then went off, and they, they had this uh, conversation, the rabbi actually asking Dr. Wilson what he thought. And so uh, Dr. Wilson is one of those great people at Gordon College, uh, classic, and uh, totally understanding much of Judaism. And actually, the Jewish folk themselves consider him mishpacha, which means family, which is a very, very, uh, I've never heard actually another Christian being considered mishpacha like that. So Dr. Wilson, the synagogue structures, even the North Shore of uh, Boston here. Okay, 